now being recorded and live streamed. So I'll take this adherent for this meeting of the Executive Committee held on the 2nd of November 2022. I can see that Councillor Allison is here, as is Councillor Anderson, Councillor Brown. Just looking to see if Councillor Carmichael is here. I'm not seeing Councillor Carmichael. Um, I'll check that later, but thank you. Um, I see that Councillor Chalmers is, is participating, as is Councillor Clark, Councillor Convery, Councillor Cooper. I'm not seeing anything from Councillor Cooper. Councillor Cowan, I see that you're here, as is Councillor Devlin, Councillor Fagan, Councillor Miller, Councillor Hamilton, Councillor Horsham is participating, Councillor Logan is also here, Councillor Loudon is here, Councillor Hugh MacDonald is here, Councillor Ian McCallan is here, as is Councillor McClymont, Councillor McCreary, Councillor Leslie MacDonald, Councillor McGeever, Councillor McLachlan, Councillor Nelson, Councillor Razak and Councillor Ro Rob. I have apologies from Councillor Ross. I understand that um, I've, I've been advised that Councillor Salamati is, um, is participating, um, substituting for Councillor Ross, but I don't see Councillor Salamati as being present at the meeting at the moment. Um, Councillor Shearer, I have apologies for Councillor Horn substituting for Councillor Shearer, and I see that uh, he's participating in the meeting, and Councillor Walker is also at the meeting. There are also a number of officers in attendance at the meeting. Thank you. I'll hand back to you, Chair, for the business of the meeting. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Pauline, can I ask now, are there any declarations of interest? I'm not seeing any declarations of interest. Can I come to the minutes of the previous meeting? Are there any questions arising from the minutes of the previous meeting? Not seeing any questions arising from the minutes of the previous meeting. Can we agree those minutes? Yeah. Can I come now to item three, which is the monitoring items? And can I ask, uh, it's the first of our monitoring items on the revenue budget, and can I ask Paul Manning to speak to this report? Uh, thanks, Chair, and good morning, Committee. Uh, the first paper that you've got is the Revenue Budget Monitoring Item, and that takes us up to the 7th of October in terms of our monitoring period. I'd probably take you, first of all, to the second page of the paper. And there are, there are two things in here that we've, we've brought to each of these revenue uh, monitoring reports when we've uh, brought them to you this year. We look at inflationary pressures and we look at areas of underspend. And we obviously look at inflationary pressures given the current economic climate. And there are two things that are being brought out under that heading. One is education transport, so it's schools transport. That's handled in terms of contracts by Strathclyde Passenger Transport. And they've notified the Council in terms of the outcome of contract renewals that there's potentially a significant increase in spend in school transport. So we need to work with them to look at the detail of that, quantify it properly, and we'll report that to a future meeting. We also cover their social work, children and families. And again, we've covered that in previous reports to the committee. So there continue to be financial pressures within that budget with spend on external placements being the main reason for the continued increase in spend. Now, there is a note at the foot of paragraph 433 that says, last year, some core adult and older people's budget underspend was retained by the council to help cover the children and families budget pressure. And we're discussing the same approach with the Health and Social Care Partnership Chief Officer and Chief Financial Officer for the current year 2022-23. So the paper then looks at areas of underspend. And again, to, to the committees this year, we've reported an underspend in employee costs. And as we've done in previous reports, we, we give some of the reasons that are behind that. And again, the, the points noted there that that figure now sits at £2.890 million. Pounds. And obviously the reasons are given across Section 4. Also, and again, we've reported this uh, in, in the previous reports on children, uh, sorry, adult and older people. This is at the foot of page 18 of your papers. 
there are likely to be further underspends in relation to specific funding streams in adult and older people. And again, I make that point in terms of the discussions with the Chief Financial Officer at the Health and Social Care Partnership and the Council potentially looking to that underspend to manage pressures within children and family services. So in terms of the overall recommendations within the paper, uh, it looks at that overall uh, position on the revenue budget and asks for it to be noted. And it also refers to the housing revenue account budget position at the 7th of October, which is break even. And happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I ask if there are any questions on item three? I'm not seeing any questions either in the room or online. So, see, before we proceed, can I just make a point? There is, um, after the last meeting of the full council, it was agreed that the leaders would convene to agree a, cost, a package of cost of living support measures. Um, that one isn't captured by this report, but will be reported at a future meeting. I just want to thank all the group leaders from all parties for their cooperation and being able to put together that package, and to the officers who put that, those proposals forward. I believe it will make a difference this winter, and I want to thank everybody for their cooperation. Okay, there are no questions. Can I move now to item four, which is uh, a monitoring item on the capital programme? Oh, sorry, is that agreed? Sorry, can we agree the report? We can agree the report. Um, can we move now to item four, which is the monitoring item on the capital programme, and can I come to Paul Manning again to speak to that report? Okay, thanks, Chair. So this is the, the capital monitoring paper, and at the foot of page 25 in, in your papers, we can see that we, we now uh, look to a, a revised programme of £95.88 million. So that's an updated budget. And that's a decrease of £1.177 million. Now, the, the main reasons for that are actually summarised in the body of the paper at 4.2. So it refers to uh, a review of the anticipated timing in two projects, the Rural Business Centre at Lanark and the Vacant and Derelict Land uh, Funded Allotment Project at Cunningham Loop. Now, what you can see on page 28 of your papers are all of the adjustments, and the, the paper looks for approval of those, and it gives a bit more detail on those two projects at Cunningham Loop and the uh, Rural Business Centre. The second page of the paper just makes the point that the, the programme still includes three big projects what we're spending this year is at a risk. It's not that the delivery of the projects are at a risk, it's just the amount that gets spent in this financial year. So the things that are covered off there are Clyde Bridge, Lark Hall Leisure Centre, and the match funding that we've got in the programme for the levelling up fund set of projects. Now, we are going to provide an update to the next meeting of the committee, because at that stage, one of these big uh, projects we're likely to have more clarity on, and obviously there's a paper later on in the agenda on Clyde Bridge. In terms of what we've spent, that's covered off in uh, the remainder of section four. It gives it the position and where we, you know, where we sit in terms of what we would be expected to have spent at this point in time. And we also do that for the housing capital programme. And you can see that at 5.3, we're within 45,000 pounds of our budgeted spend at that point. So in terms of recommendations, I'm looking for noting of the position on the, the general fund and the capital, uh, the housing capital programmes, and also approval of those adjustments that I talked about on page 28. Thanks, Chair. Thank you for that, Paul. Can I ask if there are any questions in the room on this item? I don't see any questions in the room or indeed online in this item. Can I ask then if there are no questions that we agree? Item four, are we agreed? Okay, I come now to item five, which is additional funding from the Scottish Government and other external sources. Uh, Paul Manning, can I return to you for this report? Okay, thanks, Chair. So this uh, just looks at additional funding that's come in since we last reported uh, back at the end of September. And there are two amounts. Uh, which are related, which are picked up in the paper. Both of them relate to community-led local development initiatives funding from the Scottish Government. So there's a revenue fund amount of £198,000 
That's in the current year. And again, in the current year, we've got a capital amount of money of £85,000. So, again, just looking to notify the committee of the receipt of those monies. Thank you very much. Uh, again, can I ask if there are any questions on item five? Not seeing any questions. Can we agree the report? Come now to item six, which is a community planning update on quarter four. And can I ask uh, Tom Little, sorry, Paul, that's muscle memory. Can I ask uh, Tom Little to speak to the report? Thanks, Chair. Yes, I give a Paul a break at this point. So it's, um, this report uh, brings before the committee an update on community planning activities. And in particular, there's a, a full report in terms of progress made against the community plan's performance measures, and that's Appendix 1 to this report, and also a more narrative um, annual report covering the same period, 2021, which is Appendix 2. So both of these have already been approved by the Community Planning Partnership Board in September, um, and I'm here for noting with the main elements summarised in this cover report for you. So the background in Section 3, page 37 of your papers, it's worth noting that um, this report covers a period up to the end of March 2022. So it's the, it's the last update in terms of the previous community plan. As members know, the community plan in tandem with the council plan was reviewed and both were renewed and approved this year. So uh, performance updates um, like this will look different in future too because they are being reviewed too on the back of that new community plan. It's the last time we'll see it in this format. So section four, this is now page 30 of your report, um, kicks off with some performance highlights and they're shown in the bullet points for you at 4.2. Um, the report then turns to a summary of the performance measures which are detailed in full in appendix one to this report. As you'll see, it uses the usual brag format um, to summarise progress made against what are 120 measures in total to monitor against the progress of the community plan. So table one, now on page 39 of your papers, uh, captures six of these 120 measures, and these are the statistical measures, and you'll see they're all showing it green. Table two over the page is a little bit more complex, uh, and it summarises interventions um, that have been undertaken in terms of the eight priorities under the community plan. So over all 120 measures, you'll see that um, at 4.9, that eight are showing as completed, that 95 are on course um, as planned, and of the others, 13 are showing at amber and four are showing at red. Now, as usual, the details of those ambers and reds are picked up in more detail in the, the report, and you'll see them in the following pages, and they fall under the headings of each of those priorities I was mentioning before. And they come with comments according to the performance so far, but also importantly, a note on any actions being taken to improve the outcome across those reds and ambers. So this part of the report, as I say, it's, um, it's here for noting by the committee, and it runs to page 50 on your papers, and it covers the areas of inclusive growth, financial inclusion, supporting parental employment and childcare, improving housing, education, skills and development, health and inequalities, safeguarding from risk or harm, and improving local environment and communities. So as I take all that detail, takes you to page 50 in your papers, uh, and you'll see there uh, 5.1, uh, an update on a review of the community planning structure, which has been undertaken in the same way the performance uh, reports are changing, so it better aligns with the community plan and reflects its uh, priorities. So you'll see at 5.2 that while that ongoing review is, is being undertaken, the board has agreed uh, an interim board structure set out for you at 5.2 in the numbers there. So the committee has been asked to approve um, the board's recommendations on that, but also to note that when the review is complete, um, the new structure, including the boards, will come back before this committee for your consideration. So one last point I'd make on that review is that in line with the aspirations set out by the Council Administration, one of the things that's been looked at as part of the review is a focus on local economic development and the possible establishment of a new thematic uh, board looking at the green economy. So the recommendations for this committee are to note the details of progress as outlined in the two appendices um, and approve the board's interim arrangements for its thematic boards. Happy to take any questions if I can. Okay, thank you very much for that report. Uh, can I ask if there are any questions either in the room or online? And can I come in the first instance to Katie Loudon? 
Thanks, Chair, and good morning, everyone, and thanks, Tom, for going through this paper. Um, three quick points to this question, um, which is a question for the administration rather than for Tom himself. Um, page 51, 5.6, references made to aspirations in an administration document, New Hope, New Leadership. Um, councillors were promised, um, after asking for, a copy of an administration document a few weeks ago. Nothing's been forthcoming. So the first question is, where is it? Where does this document exist? And how can councillors and members of the public access it? And finally, who has it been shared with so far? Thanks, Chair. OK. Um, my understanding is it was circulated. It was notified to the press. Um, but if councillors don't have it, we'll circulate it today. And it has been shared with the CMT, certainly, because it will inform the priorities of our administration. Um, can I come? For a second, Chair. Chair. On you go. Yeah. Please. Um, thank you for answering those. The second part of my question was how can members of the public access the document? Is it going to be publicly available? My understanding it was shared with the press, but we'll, if we can find a way of making it publicly available, we will. Um, I'll go back and check what was in our, the content of our press statement, uh, and we'll take that on board. OK. Can I come now to Councillor Nelson? Hang on a, hang on a second. We've jumped from Councillor Nelson to Councillor Clark. So that one there. there. There you go, Richard Nelson. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it was just in regards to um, safeguarding from risk or harm from Police Scotland, and Police Scotland being a major part of the Community Planning Partnership. But I'm sure we all received the same email um, from Superintendent um, Andy Thompson in regards to the Scottish Government's plan proposal uh, in the spending review, which could see the policing in Scotland £7 million, pounds, and a slight capital allocation. Um, will also decrease. And, and my question is really, Tom, is how will that will affect the community planning partnership going forward, especially if we're looking at the violence and the drug uh, education workshops that were delivered by police, police Scotland? If we're going to see um, spending cut by the, the current SNP Scottish Government of um, £97 million, pounds, surely that's going to have a knock on effect to the community planning partnership plan. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of the the content in relation to sort of police and justice. I'm not sure the extent to which our officers will be able to to, to respond to that. I don't know if they. Um, I'm, I'm getting a sense that maybe that's not something they're in a position to, to to respond to. Can I make an observation, just given some of my. Um, some of the discussions that are taking place elsewhere. And I think what we're seeing from the police service and from the fire service is actually a very effective campaign to promote their, their, their importance and the importance of those public services being well resourced. And I do think there are lessons there actually for local government, given sometimes it can be hard to communicate the, the really the essential nature of local government services because of the sheer breadth of services that, that we provide. Um, but we will all have seen the comments from the from the police. I think they were the superintendent emailed all of us and that seems to be part of a concerted national effort for people to understand the, the importance of, of Police Scotland and the services that they provide and the financial pressures that they're under. So do you want to add anything to that, Councillor Nelson? Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Chair. I, and yeah, I wasn't trying to put pressure on the officer, but I think it's just to, to have, have that at the forefront, that if these cuts do come forward, it is going to have a knock-on effect on our communities. We've got further on the antisocial behaviour um, strategy coming forward in this paper as well. And that will affect the antisocial behaviour, because every time, and we'll bring that up when it comes further up, but any time I go to a council officer about antisocial behaviour, they tell you to phone 101. But it sounds like things 101 is going to shut down, because we don't have the amount of police to do it. So we need to, to start thinking how this council will deal with, with these things going forward, um, because these cuts are coming, whether we like it or not. 
I think the point has been well made, and can I say, I suppose, with my other hat on as chair of the Community Planning Partnership, I'm happy to relay these points back to the back to the police as well, um, and we will come to that item later on the antisocial behaviour strategy. But I think the point is well made. Um, I, apologies for some jumping about there. Can I come now to Councillor Clark? Thank you, Chair. It's no problem. Uh, just following on from Councillor Loudon's uh, question, you mentioned that the, the recent full council, there was two documents. Are you referring to both documents? I'm referring to... Do you know what, Councillor Clark? I can actually give you this at the end of the meeting and I'll send you away with it. The, there is a partnership document and there was another document, you're quite right, which is appended into that document there. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Councillor McCreary. Thanks, Chair. Um, I got a question on page 41 regarding in inclusive growth. growth. Um, and I just really wondered why the performance from the new provider elevator is so poor. Um, it, mentions, it mentions COVID, but presumably COVID has been a factor throughout the, the Scotland and indeed the UK. So why, why is elevator particularly falling behind and comparison to other uh, other areas. Thanks, Chip. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to suggest that perhaps David Booth wants to pick that question up. David? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair. So, so um, Councillor, in terms of the um, of Elevator, that this is the first year of their um, that they've been in place. So some of the the figures that we're dealing with here through the, this is, is figures that date from 2020, say from the, uh, the the latest figures which come from the Office of National Statistics. So when it talks about, like for example, a downturn uh, in the number of business startups, it's from that date. So Elevator, I've, I've only been in this last year, and we've been putting in measures. We've appointed uh, a number of uh, sector-specific economic development officers over the last year. And, at the last Community Enterprise Resources Committee, we made those permanent employees now rather than temporary employees, uh, and I think that's making a difference. So uh, we're hoping, again, the figures go up to which is the first year of COVID. So there may be there, there may be some uh, limited growth in, in further years until we get up to the, the current the current year just now, and then I, I think we'll start to see an increase in the number of businesses that are growing. Hope that helps answer. Okay. Can I ask if there are any other questions on this item? And if there are not, can I ask that we agree the report? OK, I'll come now to item seven, an item for decision. The first of them is on licensing of short-term lets. And can I ask Geraldine McCann to speak to the report? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> This report is an update for committee on a new piece of legislation that was brought in earlier this year and came into force on the 1st of October. The legislation adds to the Civic Government Scotland Act a new licensing scheme for short-term lets. Now, it was mainly brought in to address issues that were experienced in Highland area and Edinburgh area because of the impact of short-term lets on their communities. Um, it doesn't have the same universal effect across Scotland, but um, we all have the scheme and we are all obliged to put a scheme into place. So the scheme within South Lanarkshire did open on the 1st of October for any new applicants. As um, the background in section three explains the reasons and the rationale for it and the various timescales. Section four uh, shows you that in South Lanarkshire, we, we are of the understanding that as of 2019, which was the last time the figures were updated, um, there were 209 properties within South Lanarkshire and they are scattered across the area. There may be some in the more tourist areas than in the urban areas. Um, <coughs> In terms, of the, in terms of the scheme, we must have a statement of licensing policy, and the statement of licensing policy is appended at Appendix 1 of this report for your approval today. This has been subject to public consultation, and 
We got four responses, which was quite a poor response, um, considering the length of time it had been out. Um, two of those responses were really criticisms of the legislation, which we can't. We have no discretion to alter. We are obliged to comply with the legislation. The other comments were um, on the scheme itself, and these have been addressed and the scheme updated to take account of the comments received. There will be financial implications for the Council because the Council has to set up this scheme and monitor it and also there will be an inspection regime that has to be established as well. So we have to charge a fee for that and the fees are set out in the policy and the fees are dependent upon the size of the property. It's a three-year fee, so there will be one charge for properties that can house up to five people and then five to ten and then beyond. Um, and these are all set out in the licensing scheme that's attached. The consultation responses are attached at Appendix 2 for your information. So taking you back to the recommendation, I'm asking you to note that the scheme is now um, opened, that the Council must have a scheme, um, that the powers in relation to mandatory and discretionary controls under the Act are noted, that the proposals for delivering the scheme within the existing licensing and registration team are noted, that the draft statement of licensing policy at Appendix 1 be approved and that the responses to the consultation be noted. Given this is a brand new scheme, it's also recommended that we go out and consult again on the policy after it's been in place for a year, because we will all have learned lessons from that and how it works. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I ask if you have any questions on this item to indicate now? Um, can I come in the first instance to Councillor Andrea Kevin? Okay, um, thanks, Chair. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to extend my thanks to Geraldine. Um, I had some um, reservations about how we were going to check the, the license holders because there are four types of license and in two of the cases um, the license holder can remain in situ in the property along with whoever um, is using their property as an Airbnb. So I just wanted some clarification which Geraldine gave me tons of, <laughs> thank you very much, um, and that allayed my fears. Um, the other thing that I noted was that the Council has a statutory obligation um, to process these applications within, for an existing host, 12 months and for a new host applicant, nine months. Um, and I just noted that that wasn't, um, wasn't advised in this scheme in our policy. But again, um, Geraldine advises that that's because it's out with the Council's um, Remit. We don't really have any, any levers for that, um, but I would um, like to know how that will be made, um, that information, how that will be made available to applicants, um, and is there a possibility that we could advertise that on the website so that when applicants um, are filling in their, their application, they're aware that the Council do have set timescales within which they must um, process the, the application. Um, and just another question, I see that there will be one member of staff employed and I know that we're only looking at around 200 possible applications, um, but it sounds like quite a lot of work. Will one member of staff will be confident that that will be enough? Um, thanks. Okay. Uh, Geraldine, can I come back to you? Oh, come back to you. Thank you, Chair. The, there will be guidance notes published for all applicants on the website, the Council website, with the application forms. So that will set out all the additional detail um, so that um, hosts and operators will be aware of that and all of the additional checks that will have to be made. Um, we have, we don't really know, it will be a lot of work to set the scheme up and that's why we're seeking an additional member of the team. But we do have an existing team that is well used to working with licensing schemes and handling licenses. And um, we would hope that once the scheme is set up, and more importantly, once we have a computer system set up to deal with this, that will ease the pressure and we will be able to deal with it. <clears throat> Why I'm suggesting we look at it again in a year is because we don't know the impact that it's going to have on community and enterprise, because building standards, planning and environmental health will also be involved in this um, with the inspection regime, 
because the Scottish Government are suggesting that we ask the public to produce to us um, electricity, gas safety certificates, etc. But there may be public safety issues um, that have been raised by Scottish Fire and Rescue that community and enterprise will need to send somebody out to actually check it out. And there could be uh, a cost to the Council for that. And that's um, what we need to see the impact of that and come back to committee in a year's time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I come now to Alec Allison? Thanks, Chair. Um, first thoughts are that uh, it's disappointing that we're having to do this. It's adding extra bureaucracy onto the tourist in industry for no real benefit, if any, in our own area. It seems to be based on the premise that Edinburgh and the Western Isles are needing action taking so we've all to suffer equ equ equally. Um, but there are a number of issues within this. Uh, the licensing division will be looking after the licensing of the premises. But is there going to be a planning implication as well if someone is setting up one of these businesses? Is there going to need to be uh, policies drafted for that? Or, is, or does that not get included? And I'm not as convinced as the last speaker about how this is going to be policed and managed. Um, like the Airbnb is basically an American company. So yes, you can send somebody out to the premises. Are you going to throw people out who are actually in them during their short-term lights? Or how are you going to manage the American company that is uh, looking after these air, the air and B, and B companies? Um, it, it seems uh, an overreaction to what we are needing. Remember, we only have 209 Airbnbs in South Lanarkshire a ridiculously small number for our tourist industry. So maybe that explains why we haven't had a response from them. Uh, and they do not think it's um, going to be particularly effective uh, in what we're doing. I think uh, we definitely need the review in a year's time because it's not uh, looking at this time as if it's going to be beneficial at all to our industry. Uh, that is needing a great deal of support at the moment. Geraldine, to, uh, do you want to pick up the questions that were in there? As far as planning goes, um, the council, we're not proposing within the council scheme that we set up any control areas, um, short term like control areas, because we're not, we don't have a scale of a problem um, that other areas have, other council areas have. However, we are advising and it will be included in the guidance notes for all hosts and operators who want to convert a property um, into an Airbnb or a short term let to check with planning and building control. Certainly if um, they are doing works to a house, they will need building control warrant. And if it's alterations, extensions, they will need planning. So that will be in the guidance notes for everyone to check before they submit their application. And as far as the other impacts, um, there could be in the, the bigger areas where there's a lot of concentrated Airbnbs, what they are finding is that there can be antisocial behaviour um, arising from that. But hosts and operators can control that um, by the conditions they impose on their lets themselves. And we have conditions within the scheme um, which will be included on that, and if there are any issues like that, then a host or an operator can be called before um, the licensing committee, so there could be a hearing. Um, in the same way that there is for any license where there's issues, um, they can be called before the council, the licensing committee, to address those issues, particularly if there's regular complaints about antisocial behaviour or criminal activity or anything like that from it. Okay, can I come now to uh, Councillor Ferguson Miller? Good morning. Um, Geraldine hinted uh, about the IT system, and that was what my question is. Um, I was wondering are we still using the GLAMS licensing system at the moment? 
Yes, we are using GLAMS, and that's owned by Northgate. And Northgate are developing um, across the across the board um, so as an addition to that system to deal with short-term lets that we can all use. So there's a consistent approach now. Quite a lot of councils already use Northgate, some use Civica, but they are um, working together so that we have a, a licensing system that can be used. Uh, if I can come back with a supplementary. Um, it's actually Northgate was bought over by NEC. It's no longer Northgate. Um, about a year ago, they said the system was going to end of life, but NEC have provided some of the local authorities with a note of commitment to say we're not going to develop it but we will support it and I was just thinking it might be a good idea it might be just the right time to start looking at something that's going to be a strategic supported platform going forward. That is something we will have to do for the full licensing uh, scheme because uh, GLAMS obviously handles all civic government licensing and liquor. Um, so if uh, we've been told that they are working on the system, they've attended a short-term life working group um, that all councils have been party to. Um, so we understood that they were working on an upgrade to that system. But we'll certainly check that out and we can come back to Councillor Ferguson Miller. Okay. If indicated you want to speak again? Yeah, it was just um, NEC actually have their own product. They've got a product called Assure, I believe it is. So rather than, uh, and if we've got any IT people in the room, rather than a sort of an upgrade to an N minus one, which is, you know, almost the latest version, this would be a completely new one. Right, hang on a second. I think I have a point of order. Hang on for companies and IT. Thanks, Gladys. Um, it's, it's not a point of order, but I, um, the, uh, the councillors made their point. Um, is there anything in that remaining to be responded to, Geraldine? I'll defer to you. I'm not indicating that, that you are, or indeed for finance and IT. That being the case, I think we note what uh, Councillor Miller, Ferguson Miller has said. Can I ask, if there are no other questions, can we agree the report? We are ag agreed. Can I come now to item eight, which is the Council Workforce Plan, and can I invite uh, Kay McVeigh to speak to this report? Thank, thank you, Chair. As you say, this uh, report updates the Committee on the Council's Workforce Plan covering the period up to 2025 and also highlights some key strategic actions that are required in relation to workforce planning. So this is not our, our first uh, go at workforce planning in the Council. Uh, we, we put in place a, a new toolkit in 2016 and then we had a five-year workforce plan. This one you'll, you'll note is a, a three-year period, just really reflective of the changing circumstances that we find ourselves in. And uh, we, we feel that three years is going to give us a, a better opportunity to adjust um, as we go through what has been quite a disruptive time. At section four, you can see the four planning stages in terms of workforce planning. Stage one is really looking at where the resource is heading, what's, what's impacting on the resource. Stage two is taking our available data, what we know, what the facts are, uh, and applying that against where we think the resource is heading. We then agree the objectives of the plan and move into stage four, which is about actions and implementations. And in terms of the individual resource plans, they have been to the individual committees, so elected members will have uh, seen some of those already. This report's really providing an overview of the Council workforce plan. So you've got the action plan attached at Appendix 1. It, it gives a, an overview of the key themes that we've seen, the actions that are consistent across uh, the, the full Council, uh, those that are strategic within the, the workforce plans. And at 5.2, uh, we've detailed the, the key workforce planning themes that we've seen. So mem members will be very familiar with these. We've got increased demand, a, a reduced workforce pool. In fact, that was reflective of the, the earlier report, just talking about the, the employee budgets, for example. 
We've got demographic challenges, we've got turnover. We're, we're seeing, um, and this is not just South Lanarkshire, across Scotland, uh, employees retiring a little earlier than expected, uh, which gives some issues across the piece in terms of succession planning. Um, fundamentally, we've also, across all the resources, highlighted a, a need to maintain employee wellbeing as a, as a key component. So in terms of actions, to address those challenges at 5.2, well, those actions are detailed at 5.3. So it's very much being a bit more agile around about our recruitment practices, trying out some new things, seeing what works, uh, trying to maintain our competitive advantage uh, in our area in order to uh, recruit uh, staff into, into vital roles. Uh, doing a bit more of our, our grow your own approach, so perhaps taking graduates through into professional roles. And uh, again, highlighting at the end of those, the need to maintain uh, employee health and well-being. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the risks, obviously, if we don't have uh, staff with the right skills in post at the time to take the actions that are required, that is a risk for the council. And we're reflecting that with it within our, our overall arrangements. And we will be keeping a very close eye on progress against the, the individual action plans uh, throughout the period. Because as I said at the start, it's quite a fast moving, developing picture that we're seeing across Scotland. Uh, and it'll be important that we maintain a focus on our workforce plan and adjust uh, as, as required as things uh, become a bit clearer. So I'm asking for the report to be noted and for the workforce plan attached at Appendix 1 to be approved. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. Can I ask if there are any questions in that report, could you please indicate just now? And I will come to uh, Ali Salamati. Thanks, Chair. Can I just uh, check if you can hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I did not see any references regarding monitoring and improvement of equality measures in Appendix 1, particularly in uh, C page uh, 174. I appreciate this is uh, in, included in the work, workforce strategy, strategic document previously pre uh, presented, and details of a strategic action will be provided elsewhere. Saying that, would you be kind enough to advise where and when we can find uh, find out about detailed strategic actions regarding improvement in areas of uh, previously identified deficiencies in workforce on their representation, such as gender, disability, race, etc.? Please, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, can I come to Kay McVeigh to pick that up? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, for, thank you for the question. There's probably a couple of areas to look at for the for the information that you're looking for. One would be the updates on the, the mainstream equalities report, which will contain a fair bit of detail round about that, but also more generally in the workforce monitoring reports that come before committee and, and council. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, can I come now to Councillor... Uh, can I come now to Richard Nelson? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the, the plan. Okay, just just a, a quick question on um, the the budget process. If, if we can't continue to meet the budget that we expect to meet, and there, there's bigger demands um, going forward, um, will, will there be expected any sort of natural wastage or redundancies um, within the Council if we can't meet that um, as, as a risk? Okay. Uh, Kay, can I pass it back to you? Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. I suppose it's interesting when we when we first looked at workforce planning as a council, our workforce plan uh, way back was all about growth and, and development, and then we, we moved into the period of austerity, and our workforce plan at that point was more about um, reskilling, redeploying uh, the workforce in order to to meet need and changing need in different areas. Uh, this time round, what we're seeing in the, in the budget is that we're not able to fill the vacancies that, that we have. So we're, we're underspent in terms of employee budget. But that's not to say within the workforce plans for individual resources, they haven't looked at where there will, will be a reducing need and where there consequentially will be an, an increase in need in other areas. So we are still very much about our, our switch to process, so redeploying workforce from one place within uh, the organisation to, to another. But at this point in time, our turnover is increasing. So uh, as a council, and again, we're not unique in Scotland in this, uh, we're seeing much more turnover than we've had uh, previously. So a combination of the turnover, the earlier retiral, that, that wastage uh, 
uh, natural wastage figure that you're talking about is, is increasing. So I, I'm not really seeing that in terms of a, a difficulty in terms of our budget going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Robert Brown. Thanks very much, Chair. I think this is what, actually one of the more important reports that has come before the Council in recent times because of the sheer pressure there is on resource. Um, almost every job you seek to look at, there's an issue to do with um, the ability to recruit, you know, Brexit, whatever the background to, to that happens to be. So it's going to be an ongoing challenge, I think, which is going to cause problems in the delivery of the Council's services at various levels. I think it's quite important we keep a close monitoring eye on this. I appreciate it's going to be monitored by the, um, um, the, the corporate management team, but I think it should come perhaps as an appendix or some sort of adaptation to the workforce monitoring programme, both to the executive and to the resource committees to keep an eye on it. There's quite important initiatives in here, the Care Academy, the growing our own um, um, resource stuff. Behind it, I mean, Councillor Salamati talked about the issue of equalities. I've always thought that one of the few good sides about the problem was the ability perhaps to um, you know, bring into the workforce more people from the left out category, so to speak. Um, I think there's some potential to do that as well. And then finally, in, in terms of just the um, moving moving forward on the whole thing, um, I think there's some potential to look at also the processes. Are there things we are doing that we could perhaps, um, you know, less priority could be less done, aren't actually necessary to deliver the outcome? Um, because otherwise we're going to have burnt out staff as well um, who are you know, having to go through processes which arguably don't achieve things. Now, I know that's been looked at, but it is an issue, I think, to keep in mind on it. So really the monitoring thing is the main thing. Can we keep an eye on this? Can it come back to committee in the way that I've suggested, perhaps on, on, on a in addition to the Workforce Monitoring Programme. Thank you very much. Um, can I come to Kay McVeigh? There we go. I'm, I'm in the room now. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, uh, Councillor Brett, I would expect some of those big initiatives to be reported back through to the individual resource committees because they will be of interest uh, to, to the committee for that particular item. It's certainly straightforward enough to add something into the workforce monitoring reports then that, that go both to the individual resource committees and um, yeah, yeah, back to the executive eye committee. Eye. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions. I, think I agree with that last... <laughs> contribution. This is one of the most important papers that we'll be agreeing to date. There is a huge recruitment challenge in the in the economy just now and certainly in local government just now. So this is something that we'll continue to monitor. Okay. Um, can I ask that we agree the report? Okay. Can I come can I can I come now to Item 9, which is the scheme of delegation, and can I come back to Geraldine McCann to speak to this report? Thank you, Chair. Uh, this report just asks for the ad addition of two additional uh, pieces to the scheme of delegation. The first one comes from the short-term lets, which you've just approved. So to add that into the Executive Director of Finance and Corporate Resources delegated powers, um, and the second one relates to prevent duties and the prevent multi-agency panel. That has always sat within the Executive Director of Housing's um, delegated powers, but it's to make it a statutory duty. So it's a small addition to that, to make it a statutory duty to comply with the Counter-Terrorism Act and to do the necessary reports, etc., that he has always done. So I'm just asking committee to approve those additions. Okay. Are there any questions on that report? Not seeing any questions. Can I ask that we agree the report? Agreed. agreed we are agreed. Um, can I come now to item 10, which uh, in return to Paul Manning, this is an update on the budget strategy and item for noting. Paul. Thanks, Chair. So, as you say, th this follows on from the report that we had at the last executive committee, which gave... A, a, a picture after the summer period on the budget strategy. Now, in that paper that we took to the executive uh, committee in September, that report, and this is picked up at the, the foot of page 183, it showed a budget gap of £24.726 million. And that was a remaining budget gap after we'd taken a number of measures. So in this report, I'm going to talk you through four things, right? And these are the things that are summarised in the bullet points at 3.2. So 
So first of all, I'm, I'm going to give an update on some op options that we've got to reduce the funding gap. Secondly, I'm going to talk to you about the potential benefit from service concessions. Thirdly, I'm going to look at further areas for consideration that are out there, and, and this is going to focus on uh, cost and inflation pressures. And then finally, I'll talk to you uh, just to summarise the position and point towards the next steps in dealing with this. So, remember, we're picking up from that position of, of 24 and three quarter million pounds of a remaining gap. So, the first thing that I'm going to talk to you about, uh, as I said, are these options that we've identified to try and reduce that gap. So, this is uh, picks up at section five, right, and that's on page 184 of the papers. So how's this progressed since the last meeting? So again, within this first big thing, I'm going to tell you about four things within that. So it's, it's all about four things today. So the first of these four things is picked up at 5.2 and it's a finance exercise. So what we've, we've done across the past couple of months is go through budget lines, go through balance sheet items and try to identify whether there's anything else that we could get value out of in this 23-24 budget exercise. And we've identified a, a sum of £6.1 million. The items are picked up there in table one, which you can see in page 184. Uh, and they, they, that gives the breakdown of that £6.1 million. I would need to make the point right, that some of these are temporary solutions for 2023-24 only. Uh, and I'll need to reinstate them in the budget for 2024-25. And that's done later on in this paper. So that's the first of these options that we've got. The next thing that I've put down there is uh, options from reviews. So again, in that last paper, we picked up the fact that we're, we're, we have been running a series of service reviews to try and identify efficiencies, and we can get a further £600,000 from those. So you can see that noted at the foot of page 184. So the next thing I'm going to talk about in, in terms of these uh, options to reduce that gap uh, is picked up on page 185, and it's a section 5.5, and it's entitled Service Concessions. And this is annual cost reduction. So what section 5 does is give a recap on what this is. So I'll focus in at section 5.6. What this is about is uh, achieved by better matching the costs of the PPP schools to their expected lives and therefore repaying the cost of the debt across a longer period of time. Now, annually, what that would mean gets picked up in section 5.7. If that implementation is agreed, then it's expected to, re to mean a reduced annual debt charge of £4 million per annum right, to the school's PPP. So that could benefit the budget position by £4 million per year. So that's the next of these options that, I, that I'm feeding in at this point. And I'll come back later on in the paper to other benefits that are around that, and I'll talk as well about the process we would need to do to get that approved. And the, the final thing under this first section is about national insurance. So in, in terms of uh, the, the recent uh, fiscal event, the 1.25% increase and national insurance was removed, and that's effective from November 2022. So what that means is a recurring benefit to the council of three and a half million pounds, because the employer's contribution for national insurance went up as well as the employees, and both of those things have been drawn back on. So that means a benefit to our budget position of three and a half million pounds. So at the foot of page 185, there's a table, right, which is entitled Table 2, and it summarises those four benefits uh, to the Council's budget position for 2023-24, as we know it at this point in time. So what you can see is that table takes that budget gap from the 24 and three quarter million pound that we reported at the last committee, and it takes us to 10 and a half million pounds of a budget gap. So that was the, the, the first set of things that, that I was going to take you through. I'll just I'll finish off 
that first section, just by referring to the top of page 186, where it references council tax. Now, the report notes that no council tax increase is factored in to these figures at this point. It does note uh, what each 1% increase in council tax would bring into the council, and if the council tax was put up by 3.5%, that would generate around £5.5 million. Pounds. So, in terms of options right, to reduce the budget gap, that, that was that first part. The second thing I said I would talk to you about today was about service concessions, and <laughs> specifically the retrospective benefit that's attached to them. And what that section six talks through is the fact that, as, as well as an in-year benefit, as well as a, a reduced cost every year, basically, if this change was put in place, we would find ourselves in a position that by 2022, we would have overpaid right, in terms of our, our contributions up to that point on those PPP schools, and we could get the benefit of that. So there's an amount uh, that, that's quoted in here of £61 million. And then what this section of the paper does is look at some of the options right, for using uh, that figure of £61 million. And at section 6.2, it focuses on pay award. Right? And the costs of the pay award that we've got for 2022-23 in 2022-23, the cost that we're going to face in the current year and the cost that we'll face of that next year. So there are two amounts of £5.7 million. Pounds. And what I'm, I'm suggesting there is that that uh, total in £11.4 million pounds could be used right, to fund the costs of pay award right, across these two years. Also then go on at 6.3 to look at the potential to use another uh, £42.5 million pounds to support the Council's medium-term budget strategies. Now, that's across the years 24-25 through to 25-26. And I'll, I'll cover that in a, in a table in a second. At 6.4, the point gets made that how this is going to be used and whether it's done is members' decision. And the use that I'm going to cover just very briefly in a table in a second, that's coming from me. That represents a prudent approach that I would advocate. But other approaches to the use of the money could be adopted. But you would need to note the consequences that could have on future year's budget strategies. So there is an appendix at the rear that goes through that in a wee bit more detail. But there's also a summary table that's given to you as, as table three at the top of page 187. And that shows uh, the budget gap across the, the four-year period from 24-25 to 27-28, and it shows it without using those retrospective uh, service concession monies, without using that, that £42.5 uh, million pound worth of benefit. It shows you the position before doing that, and it shows you the position after doing it. And the point that I would make is what the use of the service concession allows is the budget gap to be managed over a longer period of time, we'll still need to face the same level of budget gap. It gives more time to do it and more time to adapt and to make change to allow that to be done. So that was the second thing I said I'd talk to you about. It was, it was about service concessions. The third main thing is other pressures, right? And there are other pressures that are unresolved, right? And, and may remain unresolved for, for a period of months to come, right? And I, I start to pick some of them out. And this is really to do with the climate that we find ourselves in. The first of them uh, relates to rates, right? And a, a non-domestic rate and revaluation, which is taking, going to take place ahead of year 2023-24, that is going to mean a change in the valuation basis. In part, that's tied in uh, to the inflationary climate. And what it's likely to mean is a significant increase in our rates bill of nearly uh, two and three quarter million pounds. So I, I'm, I'm putting that and I bring that back in in the summary that I, I finish off this paper with. So I'm flagging that up to the committee at this point that we may need to find 
depending on the outcome of that revaluation, which we won't actually know right until the end of November. We may need to put more money into the budget to deal with that. The inflationary pressures I start to cover in sections 6.9 and 6.10, and we've talked about these in the other reports that I've brought uh, on the budget for next year. And the, the, the risk that I'm flagging is that while we've made significant provision in our budget for inflation, more provision than we ever made in any year before, there is still the chance that inflation may increase. And, and I pick out some of the things in section 6.10 where we are exposed to the risk of further increases in inflation. And, and I just finish off that page, 187, by saying we'll continue to review these and we'll update on them uh, as part of the budget setting process. And obviously that would include coming back to you with figures after we get the local government settlement. And the fourth thing that I said I would speak to you on was just a, a, a summary of the position. What does this tell us and, and where do we go next with this? And what you can see midway down page 188 is a, a table that, that tries to give a summary position as best I can group it together from the paper that we've got. We do have a, a, re, a revised budget gap that I'm reporting, right? We've taken it down to £10.5 million through the measures that I laid out in the first part of my, my presentation to you today. So you can see that in that right-hand side column in that table. There are things that may take that up. So there's that rate in, rates increase, which, which is a, a real risk for us. Uh, and there are those other inflationary factors. What the uh, outcome of those is remains to be seen. There are, though, and this is dealt with in the lower part of that table, things which may represent a potential solution. So one of the things in 23-24 was the use of £5.7 million of that money to deal with a, the pay award from 2022-23. And the other amount, which is down there, is £5.1 million, which could be an option to manage this gap, is an increase in council tax. And the figure that's there is to the order of 3.5%. So that the point I'm making at the foot of that table is, look, we will continue to monitor the position and report on the items that I'm, I'm summarising in that table and I've dealt with throughout the, the paper. I'm likely to be back with papers eh, probably every month from now until March as we, as we start to develop this and go through it. In terms of the next steps, the, the paper does note at 7.7 .7 that the Scottish budget, eh, when I wrote the paper, was due to be released on the 15th of December. There is more doubt around that now and fallback dates have started to be quoted uh, at, almost at the end of December, just before Christmas, and then in the first working week in January. So it still remains to be seen when that Scottish budget is going to be released. And the, the part of that is to do with movements and dates relating to the UK budget. Uh, the, the Scottish Government did intend to give an emergency budget statement, which didn't happen, but I believe there may be an announcement in Parliament this afternoon but the extent to which that covers off what we expected it to, I don't know. So, you, you know, in terms of when we get our budget and our settlement for next year, at best I can say it's likely to be at some point between mid-December and January. And at that point, we can start to, to bring the position uh, to, to, to you in more definite terms. So see if I can go back to the recommendations. It's section 2.1. It's looking for noting of a succession of things. In terms of the budget strategy, those options to reduce the budget strategy, taking it from 24 and three quarter million pounds to 10 and a half, can they be noted? I've asked for noting right, of that service concession retrospective benefit and also the, the annual benefit they may arise uh, and the potential utilisation, which I mapped out in the table within the paper. So again, noting of that, remember I will need to come back to council to get approval to do that. And the, the two items at the bottom in terms of noting of those other budget areas for consideration and the summary and next steps. And I'll just finish by saying, Chair, all members have been invited to a briefing now on the 18th of November. 
and that the purpose of that will really be to share what's a lot of detail included in this paper with the wider group of councillors. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, Paul, for that very comprehensive update. Um, can I ask if there are any questions on this paper? I have uh, Alec Allison. Yeah, Chair Paul, um, really glad you're here because this is a heck of a complicated um, situation, if you, if you like. But once again, you've come up with a solution. Um, there's two ways of looking at that solution. You're changing a uh, budget gap, um, I think it's next year, from 36 million helping there, but by the following year, the budget gap is almost 40 million. Now, as you say, that then gives us obviously more time to identify how we're going to address these um, budget gaps. But if we just sit here today and approve when the budget comes through at the beginning of next, next year, and don't have a plan, a plan in place as to how we are going to address that budget gap in two or three years' time that's significantly increased, all we're really doing is kicking the ball down the road. It makes us feel better today, but it'll make things a lot worse then. Therefore, as part of making use of these concessions, should we not be looking now at what we need to do to manage that budget gap in the future and not just leave it till the last minute. I'm going to ask Paul to respond to that, and then I'm going to make a couple of comments myself, if that's all right, before coming to uh, Councillor Rob. Paul. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Councillor Allison. Right? It, 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 it's an absolutely vital point in all of this. What I've mapped out is a situation whereby using the service concession money we can take the, the steepest cliff face that we've got to face and get a couple of years to prepare for it. Where I would totally agree with you is that's only of worth if that preparation is done. Right? And if, if we lay the groundwork and we develop a plan, and can I tell you I have a plan today to deal with what comes, I can't. Right? So I I would I would agree with you in that point. I, I would say I don't think it's you know in, in terms of our intention, it's not to sit in our hands and wait for this to hit us. The point of laying it out in the paper like this is to say, look, this is the extent of the issues that do faces. As a council, we've maybe got an opportunity that others aren't going to have, right? That you know potentially they, they face a cliff face sooner than we do. We've got a chance to prepare and to adapt, and I would agree with you, we need to take it. Yeah, thanks for that. I just want to come back on that, that point as well, because I think, obviously, this, this item today is an item for noting, and as Paul said, there will be regular reports between now and the conclusion of the, the, the budget process for the new financial year. The service concession benefit is not something... I think any of us want to squander. If it does buy us time, then I have to say there are a number of areas where I quite understand you would not necessarily have a fully developed plan as to how to close a budget gap of that scale in each year. But if we take, for example, we've recently recruited a new head of enterprise and sustainability. Part of that job role, as you, as you know, was to look at how we generate income for the council. There are plenty of areas where I think we have to look at our... our um, our, our budget our, the, beyond the regular budget process that, that we engage in on a year-to-year -year basis. I think my understanding, because this has been um, briefed to various to, to leaders last week, it's part of a, an ongoing process. I think every department, every department has been through a tough time. They have been through a tough few years um, because of the austerity we've had to endure. There aren't a lot of easy decisions left to make when it comes to reducing budget gaps. So what we have to engage in now is quite serious and, and fundamental reform and a exploration of how we can generate new income streams for the, for the council. And I would also just say, tied to that, there is also the work that we do as influencers, as, 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 as a voice for the community. 
that are really set out in this report. It's a very volatile position. Even now, Paul has done a huge amount of work to take this gap, not from 24 million to 10.5 million, but actually from 32 million to 10.5 million. There is still a lot of volatility in this paper. And I think it's incumbent on all of us who are part, members of political parties, or if not members of political parties, then part of a a wider um, political community in Scotland, we really do have to be pressing for that certainty from the UK government around spending and fiscal policy. And in relation to the Scottish government, then I think there are a number of areas where we really need to be uh, pressing for certainty and additional resources. We have to have clarity in the position around rates that is set out. That is a, a major outstanding issue in that paper. We have to be arguing for the baselining of that £5.7 million in, in relation to the pay settlement. We have to be arguing not for um, a flat cash settlement, but actually to see real terms increases that are going to allow us to sustain services in the, the environment that is ahead. And still, although there seems to be some movement in the capital accounting review, we still need to keep the pressure on in relation to the capital accounting review, because that could um, damage uh, local government in terms of go going forward. So apologies for Apologies for, for responding at length there, but I thought it's a, the point is well made. We cannot waste the opportunity that we have just now, given the scale of the budget challenge that we face. So can I come to Councillor Rob? Thank you, and thanks for that uh, great report, Paul, and all the work that, that's been done. Uh, my comments really follow on from the, the two uh, comments that councillors made previously. Um, previous minutes have, um, and committees have highlighted the massive impact on, on budgets of the increase in energy costs over the years, and potentially we're going to see that into the future as well. So considering the opportunity that the service concessions give us, I just ask that officers and members bear in mind for this and the capital programme, the, the, some key principles around preventative spend, investing now, for example, in energy efficiency, or I'm sure there's also social work examples, can save more money later as well. So, for example, if we insulate our buildings to higher standards, then we'll save millions of pounds later in energy costs as well. But as, as uh, Councillor Fagan mentioned, there's also opportunity to invest in uh, renewables ourselves as a council and to generate income for frontline public services in the future. Right? These will not only cut carbon emissions, it will save money and also boost the green economy as well. Um, so to that end, just to request at the earliest opportunity for the council to bring forward opportunities for income generating from renewable energy to um, help plug those gaps in the future and boost the economy. Thank you. I find myself in agreement. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to pick pick that up. Cleland. Thanks, Chair. And, and uh, again, good points that are made. Just to, to give some assurance, um, officers as recently as yesterday were meeting with uh, a particular potential joint venture partner um, looking at a series of opportunities around uh, not just Renewal, renewable energy use, etc., which would lower costs, but actually the Council looking to be um, an active player in, a, in renewable energy generation that potentially would generate future uh, income streams. These are not overnight things, you'll, you'll know that. Um, the technology is moving really fast, um, and we need to ensure that we do our due diligence. But um, just to give assurance to all members, this is high on our agenda. The new appointee, who I think David arrives in January, yeah, uh, our new head of uh, enterprise and sustainable development. This will be a remit that will work right across the council. We'll work with partners uh, in every resource, um, but ultimately they'll be charged with go and make me some money to do exactly what Councillor Rob mentions, which is to protect frontline services. Thank you very much. Can I come to Councillor uh, Rizak? Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, I'd like to commend Paul because I think for a number of years now that he's been um, having to balance a budget that, that's declining rather than anything else, and that, that is a hell of a job to do, especially with um, the year-in, year-in out cuts that are to funding. Um, I was going to ask the question about the August 23 deposit return schemes supposed to be kicking in. I'm putting supposed in because everything's up in the air again. And that might have an impact with our waste because of the fact that cans, bottles, glass bottles and plastic bottles and that would be taken out of the scope 
because they'll, they'll be taken back to um, return points and um, cash down. So would that have any effect on the budget with, with the waste department? And uh, that's all. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Paul? I, I would probably make the point, Councillor Rosak, and thanks for your, your kind comments. Uh, I'd, I'd probably make the point, see in terms of our waste contracts and, and the money that we're having to pay you know, to, to dispose of waste and things like civic amenity sites, at the moment all the pressure that we can see is, is taking us up the way. Right? And that's, that's just for the reasons we've described around other things, right? Uh, and I think I've mentioned in previous papers, our bigger waste contracts are tied to uh, inflationary uplifts. So if inflation is high, it means we're faced with an uplift. So I, 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 I don't know if David wants to come in around the specifics of the deposit re return scheme. The main thing that we're seeing within these budgets is an upward pressure right, on these contracts because look, most contracts are just becoming more and more expensive. So I don't know if David wants to come in. David. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank, thanks for, for Paul. This Paul says uh, um, as, as we, we, we're looking at our waste uh, strategy at the moment uh, and the deposit return scheme is one of the things that we're factoring into that, but, but we're waiting for that scheme to come into play. Um, as we do that, we're, we're planning what, what that means for us as, as a waste service, but, um, but the costs are, are, are going up the way in terms of the inflationary rates in the way. So, so it's something that, that is, is definitely on our radar and we're trying to determine uh, what the impact would that be on our, our, our race strategy moving forward. Well, that's help. Yeah, well. Thank you. Um, just a very quick one, David. Um, I know that South Clarity Scotland are um, uh, for, 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 um, chosen Biffa as a contractor for backhauling of this deposit return scheme. Um, have you have the council spoken to um, Biffa to see if we can have any contracts with them and get paid for the backhauling for this, uh, just some means of raising income? David? Um, so so um, we haven't had any specific engagement in terms of, of that particular point, but uh, but we do we do have regular contact with Biffa and other contractors as well, so it's something that we can explore as, uh, once we know more detail. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Can I come now to Robert Brown? Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I mean, a lot of people have spoken, haven't they, about the volatility of the situation we face. I, th I don't think I can remember in my time on the Council or in, indeed in, in Parliament um, a, a time when it was just really quite as bad with so many unpredictable matters. We are grateful, I think, to Paul for the work he's done on this and his team for bringing the thing ab about. A couple of points, if I may. First of all, on the service concessions, it's really an observation more than anything else. I think it should be remembered, and the point was made, I think, by the Chief Executive at some earlier point, um, this is actually our money. This is not money we're getting from the Scottish Government. This is actually a reallocation of the way we spend our money. And I do think it's actually quite appalling that we're left in a position of having to actually use it as part of the budget strategy going forward on that particular matter. And I do hope that when we actually make the representations to government that uh, the leader talks about, that we, we do take the practical approach of trying to sort of make up for what has been actually a pretty much a salami slicing of council resources over a number of years now. You know, the council's budgets have gone down by a um, quite significant percentage, I think of approaching 9% on a like-for-like um, um, -like basis, where, where the Scottish budget has gone up by something over 4%. Now, that's a, a substantial figure. They sound small figures, but that's a substantial figure when it comes down to the reality of it. Now, OK, this is where we are at the present time. We've got to be realistic about it. But I do think that these give us very strong arguments with the government to actually um, move forward on some of the practical changes that could be made, the concession on the rates that the leader talked about, the real terms increase of the baseline, all these kind of things. These are things which I think we should be uh, not afraid to make very strong representations, public, private, and in whatever way we can, and through our own political parties and otherwise, uh, to government about it. 
Uh, can I also finally just echo the point that's been made about um, increasing revenue, because we, we, do, we don't have control over these other things other than representations. We do have a certain ability to make um, some additional revenue from one or two things going forward. We have made, um, I think, an appropriate decision on the um, electric car charging um, arrangements, um, and that seems to me to be a very good thing. There will be other things, hopefully, down the line we can do something within that regard. And it will be, I think, a top priority, really, to take that aspect of the thing forward, to do what we can to help our budget. Final point, if I may, on the service reviews, these are um, listed in the re report, there's, there's a number of service reviews taking place there. Do we have any kind of timescale for that in terms of when these will emerge? Will it come into the current budget strategy? Will it be something that will emerge over the course of the next um, um, you know, uh, 12 months or whatever uh, as, as these things come forward? What's the sort of timescale for the service review um, programme? Okay. Paul, do you want to pick that up? Right. Th thanks, Chairman. Thanks, Councillor Brown. In, in terms of the service reviews, it, it, you know, the, the, for the, the past two years, we've had programmes of work right, which have been focused on trying to, to generate efficiencies in what we do. Uh, and they, they've got two main types of output, and I'll come back to that in a second. And, and see, from the point of view of timescale, some, some of these things are things which I would probably never look to draw to a close. We would, we would keep running with them to get as much as we can from them. Uh, bearing in mind Councillor Allison's point earlier on about by the time we get to the years beyond the middle of this decade, we are looking to face uh, some really severe savings gaps, right? budget gaps that we need to bridge. So some of these things are going to run on and on. In terms of the two main types of output, Right, there are things that arise which are management and operational decisions. So it's things that we can do that don't need to go in front of yourselves, right? Be because they exist within policies that you've approved, and it's about how we run our business more efficiently. But there, there are things coming from these that I'll need to bring in front of you because they mean policy decisions, right? And, and the way that savings have in the past. So what we'll need to find time to do in this process, right, between you know, the end of November, December, through to, to February, is get them in front of committee, right, uh, for some form of decision at that point. So at that point, you'll see the output from those. Okay. If there are no other questions, can I ask that we note the report? Agreed. We're agreed. Uh, can I come now to item 11, which is uh, an update on the programme for government, and can I ask Tom Little to speak to that report? Thanks, Chair. So, yeah, this report brings a summary of the programme for government from the Scottish Government um, for 22-23. So, as well as giving you the summary, it looks specifically at how it pertains to local government and, in particular, at what it means for South Lanarkshire Council and how we can take forward relevant aspects of the programme. So, as a background notes, the, the programme was published on the 6th of September and it's entitled A Stronger and More Resilient Scotland. And the document is set out under the headings you'll see at 3.1 in the report, the bullet points there, it's page 193 of your papers. Section 4 then sets out to provide more details of how those headings and the likely actions relate to local government. And that draws on some work done by COSLA um, when the programme for government came out. So you'll see, for example, at 4.2 under the cost crisis, the, the report highlights emergency legislation you're well aware of to freeze rents and also the rollout of universal free school meal provision for P6 and P7 pupils, things that will always have an impact on the council. Um, under children and young people, the report notes um, a refreshed approach to the Scottish Attainment Challenge and moves towards uh, an all-year-round school-age childcare system um, and a learning and childcare offer for one- and two-year-olds, again, things of an impact on local government. So I don't propose to go through this in that level of detail across this, but you'll see um, there's a wide range of areas impacting local authorities um, in the pages ahead. So if I take you to 4.4 .4 in your report, uh, you'll see that on page 196 of your papers. Finally, in this section, section 4, the report notes the proposed legislative programme for 22-23 that was contained within the programme for government. You see those in the bullet points of 4.4. 4. 
Section 5 is perhaps the part of the report that is most meaningful for us because what we did was we carried out an exercise where the programme for government was um, looked at by all the resources to see, pick up every element and see what actions are already been undertaken or those that could be undertaken in terms of taking forward the actions that we've identified within it, specifically with a timeline for reporting um, how those actions are, are doing to committee. So the results of that exercise are in uh, the appendix to this report. And again, I won't go through it in every detail with you, but you'll see there's 150 actions in there. So that just talks to just how important um, the details of this are for local government. So I'm asking you to note this report, but also note that progress on the actions that we're taking that relate to the programme will be reported through exec directors to the relevant committees. Thanks. Thank you for for that report and also for the, the extensive um, papers that are in front of us. Can I ask if there are any questions on that item? Not seeing any questions on that item. Can I ask that we agree the report? Okay. Can I come now to item 12, which is the South Lanarkshire Anti-Social Behaviour Strategy, and can I invite Annette Finnan to speak to the report? Annette. Thank you, Chair. This is the annual report to Executive Committee on the review of the progress on the anti-social behaviour strategy. This is the fourth South Lanarkshire anti-social behaviour strategy that we've had developed in conjunction with Police Scotland and our community safety partners. The current strategy was approved by Executive Committee in November 2019. As noted at 3.3 of the report, there are six strategic outcomes within the strategy which relate to alcohol and drug misuse, fire safety, domestic noise, litter, fly tipping and waste, disorder and vandalism, and also engagement and access. Summarised at table one, at section 4.1, the review noted good progress against the majority of measures and actions within the strategy. Table two highlights some of the key progress made by partners during 21-22, despite some of the challenges faced during this period. Full details are contained in Appendix 1. As noted at Section 4.3, in 21-22, one measure relating to the number of deliberate refuse fires was not achieved. This position is now improving, with a decline in the numbers reported. Section 4.4 outlines the six actions or measures which were partially achieved, there was some slippage against the target, including the number of vandalism incidents reported, the number of domestic noise incidents reported, and the number of fly tipping reports received. Partners, including our antisocial investigation team, our community wardens and environmental services, are taking forward a range of actions to tackle these issues. Section 4.5 notes the five actions to be reported later. Following consultation of the Council's antisocial behaviour policy and feedback from members, we have taken forward actions to improve the promotion and the public reporting of outcomes and performance relating to antisocial behaviour. This includes articles in the Council's website, South Planets Review, local press and social media, including statements from the Chair of Housing and Technical Resources and the Chair of Community and Enterprise Resources. Further communications are planned, including around graffiti, fly tipping, issues which are affecting our communities. These will highlight the nature and scale of the problem and the joint actions being taken by the Council and our partners to tackle these. Positively, as noted at section 6 and 7 of the report, we are seeing an increase in the use of the mediation service and also decreasing volumes of antisocial behaviour complaints being made to our specialist antisocial investigation team and our local housing teams. Section 6 of the report outlines a slight amendment to the strategy, as at this point we do not have three years retrospective data collated to set baselines or targets for two of the measures. This information is currently being collated and will be available for the next annual review. Finally, if we turn to next steps, as noted in Section 9, the annual review will be presented to the Safer South Lanarkshire Board on the 12th of December. The Council will continue to work with Police Scotland and a range of partners to tackle antisocial behaviour. And the next antisocial behaviour strategy will be developed and consulted upon during 2023 and brought back to this committee. 
Executive Committee is then asked to approve the recommendation that the progress of the third annual review of this antisocial behaviour strategy attached to Appendix 1 be noted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'm aware that we have been running, there are two times incidentally in front of me, so we've actually been running for longer than anticipated without a break. If members are in agreement, I'm going to conclude this item and potentially take the next one, which is the, the, the remaining item for noting, um, without a break. But if there is any issues with that, feel free to tell me just now, just because of the point we are at in the agenda. Um, I'd imagine it depends on the, the amount of discussion that arises from this item. But unless there are any objections, I'll proceed with that. Can I come now for questions? And in the first instance, can I ask uh, Councillor Loudon? To, uh, can I come to Councillor Loudon? Hi, thanks very, thanks very much, Chair. Sorry, I'm getting an echo there. Um, it's just a, a very quick point on um, page 239, where we've got strategic outcome two on um, fire safety. And I would just like to praise the, the work of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service here. Uh, we're talking about something quite specific in that bullet point, where you're talking about um, 53 young people have completed um, a particular course. Um, but I've had reason, so I've just realised my camera slides off, there we go. Um, I've had reason to, to contact the, um, the service um, recently um, about problems in the local area. Um, and they were telling me, they, they gave me an outline of the work which they uh, have been completing in recent weeks, obviously, with the, the lead up to Bonfire Night and will be. Um, and it, it's actually several thousand young pe children and young people that they're going to be in contact with in one way and another across South Lanarkshire over this period. Um, they sent me information about school visits which they're, they're conducting and they sent me further information as well about the resources which are available for schools if their their timetable or their particular plans doesn't allow for a visit to happen so it's just a, a, a quick point to raise that although we've only got this report of um, 53 people here and i know that's something quite specific to highlight the fact that they are doing an incredible amount of work in our local communities just now and that's something to be commended thanks chair thank you uh Councillor Loudon, and the, I understand the Chief Executive is meeting with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service tomorrow, and I'm sure we'll be able to relay that positive feedback to them directly. Can I come now to Councillor Andrea Cowan? Um, thanks, Chair. Um, thanks to Katie for that um, praise of Scottish Fire and Rescue. I was going to include them in my section, but I now won't. Um, and yeah, they, they do a fantastic job. Um, I just wanted to welcome this report, really. I don't have a specific question. Um, I just wanted to note a couple of points that, that, that um, I thought were, were impressive. 22% decrease in binge drinking hospital admissions, um, I think is a, a sign that, um, that education around alcohol is, is making a, a difference. Um, I'm really pleased to see that the mediation referrals have jumped significantly. I think up 39%, showing that residents are engaging with the service rather than, um, you know, neighbour disputes getting to a point of no return. So I think that's something to be encouraged. Um, also, I, I know I heard one of the earlier speakers saying that um, when he contacts officers about. Um, um, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, when he contacts um, officers about antisocial behaviour, um, he gets told to phone 101. But I would just like to commend the community police at Rutherglen. Um, in my short time as a councillor, any time I've contacted them about antisocial behaviour, they've been fantastic. Um, and I just look forward to continued success of this programme over the next 12 months. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. Um, can I come now to councillor Alec Allison? Thanks, Chair. Um, at 4.4, it highlights the targets that we haven't met. I think that's very disappointing because a lot of these targets, I think, have been quite soft. Fly tipping, particularly uh, domestic noise complaints and antisocial behaviour um, in general. We haven't achieved these, and I don't think they're particularly strong targets. As the last speaker said, we've already highlighted the fact that too often our response has been to contact the police through 101. They have indicated that they, under the current budget proposals, are going to have severe reductions. So how are we going to deal with these issues if we simply can't pass them on to the police? When are they going to let us know if they hit these um, funding problems? They're doing a lot of work 
uh, programmes running, try, trying to improve youth behaviour, etc. Is it these that are going to be dropped? Is it the quality uh, community policemen that we've just, just heard about? Are they going to be reduced? Whatever ones of these happen, it's going to come back to us. And simply saying we'll wait until a new strategy in 2024, I don't think is a good enough answer. We need to know how we're going to work in these areas if we don't have the same level of support from the police. Can I, again, I don't particularly want to ask officers to res respond on behalf of the the police, if that's all right, but can I pick up just some of the well, points you so, made? Sorry to introduce you. I'm not asking them to, re to respond on the budget implications elsewhere. It's what we are going to do um, to, uh, to, su to support our anti-behavioural uh, right. teams. Right. They cannot be left to do a bigger, uh, more work with less resource. Right. No, I get your point is about the impact on the Council of Changes yes. in Police Funding. I understand. I'm going to come to the Chief Executive in just a second. Before I do, can I just say in relation to 4.4, um, I think I have shared with um, a number of people, it's publicly, um, it's out there in the public domain, certainly should the budget this year allow and should there be um, the, the support of the Council, it is our intention to invest resources uh, in the front line that should help with at least two of those points, one of them being fly tipping and the other being the um, satisfaction with local street cleanliness, at least that's our, our ambition. And secondly, uh, just in relation to the, the issues around 101, I think a lot of us value the relationship we have with our community police officers, to come back to Councillor Cowan's remark. I think a number of us now have been picking up over a sustained period the difficulty the public have with accessing the police through the 101 number in its current form. I think that seems to be the, the issue. And we can, we can share these concerns with the police. I'm going to come to the Chief Executive now. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> and not to extend this too far, but just to be absolutely clear, when we're talking about criminality, that's the, the, the function of Police Scotland. The comments that members have made today about the challenges that Police Scotland have are facing in terms of potential reductions in their budget, that becomes a national political issue that impacts on us locally here. But the Council doesn't run police services. I would caution us against going into a really difficult uh, financial purse that we're all facing. Paul gave a, a full illustration of it for us to then end up subsidising Police Scotland services because of challenges in national allocation. So it's, it's, it's a, maybe just an obvious point, but some of the, you know, if Police Scotland are impacted in the way that members have, have suggested that reduces their capacity to respond. Um, it will impact on this council, but the council won't be able to address criminality. Um, we need to uh, lobby for not just an appropriate a public sector settlement for local government, but also a public sector settlement for partners like Police Scotland, who, whose capacity impacts on, on the safety within our communities. Um, so it's maybe an obvious point, but just to, to say, you know, we, we don't become the safety net or the default for cuts in other public bodies. Yep. Councillor Logan. Thank you very much. Um, in actual fact, a chief executive has just said what I was going to say. We are not a policing authority, never been a policing authority, and neither would we want to become a policing authority. Uh, we have our own business to do. Um, and I have never been told at any time, oh, you better phone the police. I have always had great response from the local teams in Clydesdale. I know that I think it's once a week they have a, a round table with the police maybe fire brigade at this time of the year and various things. Um, but the first thing I always say to people is, I'm sorry, we are not a policing authority. We don't have the powers to do what you want us to maybe do. Uh, fly tipping is still there because I'm sitting this week with three different um, problems regarding fly tipping, but in particular on the police thing. I think you're right. We have to get off our knees in local government. We have to stand up now and say enough is enough. We have to support our fire people that we just heard about. We have to support our police. We have to support ourselves and say we cannot continue with the money that 
we're getting. Uh, and I think, and as I say, never have I ever been told just to phone the police. I get good responses. Um, and, and you're right, we have to um, help to support our colleagues and and uh, and, and tell, keep telling people we, we are not a policing authority. Go to your MSP, go to the Scottish Government, go wherever you like, but try and, and, and keep this message going. Thank you very much. Can I come to Councillor Razak? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just... Uh, one of the outcomes is a decrease in hospital admissions, um, admissions for for binge drinking, which is great news. But unfortunately, the alcohol deaths in in Scotland have rose. So I think there's still a lot to be done with with the alcohol and with the issues with alcohol. Uh, the other thing was um, I do a lot of sympathy with the housing department because during COVID, I think there's been a spike in. Um, neighbour disputes and everything else that's been going on with it with a raft of different things. It's really difficult to try and mediate this because, you know, you're in a no win situation and I from personal experience I've given them so much um, work to do as well, which I really appreciate the fact that they've they've they have been very diligent about. And I would just really commend the housing department for the efforts they're putting in. Thank you for your remarks, Councillor Rizak. Can I come to Richard Nelson? Thank you, Chair. Um, just to clarify, I, th I think we, uh, as a Conservative group, we were not saying that the Council will start to police. <laughs> That's not the case at all. Um, so I, I just want to, to put that on record. Um, th but although antisocial behaviour is a criminal offence, and, and if you do contact House and they do ask you to raise it with the police, um, because they have to raise a profile, and that profile has to come forward to the antisocial behaviour team meeting. Um, so, so going forward, th th this will have an effect on this plan if these cuts do, and I, I don't want to go back into because the Chief Executive already made that point, but if, if it does happen and these cuts do, it will have an effect on this current plan because we cannot, we will not be able to, to do it. So we will need to come back at some point if these cuts do happen. That's the point that we're trying to make. Uh, you know, we, we're not trying to get into a political debate here, but um, the plan will have to be reworked if these, these cuts do happen and the 101 service does get done away with. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. See, before we conclude, can I just put the, the kind of minutiae aside and just focus on the fundamental point? There is anxiety about the impact of budget reductions on one of our public sector partners on the, the council. I think, as the chief executive explained, um, I actually think there's a, a fair bit of consensus about that, actually. Um, and we do, I think, that the reality is we do see often when other parts of the public sector withdraw or are under pressure, we do find that a lot of issues land themselves at the doors of the council. And I think that's, that probably is, if I'm summing up the, the debate and summing up some of the contributions, I think is really what the, the, con the concern is about. I think it's a valid point, it's noted, and we will, as politicians across the, across the chamber, we can pursue that in our own ways, and we have to be vigilant as a uh, as a council as to the impact on our antisocial behaviour plan. I take the point on board. Are there any other questions? I don't see any other questions. Can I ask that we agree to note the report? We are agreed. Now, at this point, there have been no items of urgent business intimated to me. So um, the, there are no items under item 13. Uh, under item 14, uh, I have to confirm now that the public section of the meeting has now concluded and that the recording and live streaming of the meeting will now be stopped. So thank you, uh, everyone who has been observing.